What I'm going to talk about, uh, the, the most important word in the title is early, as we've only just started this. And um, so um, it really is a study that we're only just starting. So I'm really going to talk more about why we're doing it, because uh, we haven't actually got any results yet to show you, and we're hoping to have them by the end of summer. So firstly, uh, you've already heard from Alan, what's the aim of treatment? And the first thing is to stop trunchal reflux. And we know that we can't strip the veins, because if we strip the veins, we get neovascularization, strip track revascularization. And so therefore we're not getting any prevention of reflux in the long term. So that's one of the reasons why stripping is out and why we uh, published this in 2007. So what we know now is we know that when we're doing thermoablation, as we wrote up in the 2004 Charing Cross book, what we're actually looking for is we're looking for a uh, transmural death. And I don't think it's good enough just to get an endothelial death. And certainly we know that's the case in thermoablation. And I have a slight issue, therefore, with some of the things that we see written and spoken about with the chemical ablation techniques. So we know that if you use too low a LED and we're only getting endothelial damage, then we only get thrombosis and we don't get full destruction and we get reopening of the vein. And we also know that happens if we use chemical sclerotherapy in veins with very large um, lumens. And of course, it's nothing to do with the lumen at all because that's a surface area. It's actually a depth of wall problem, which I presented in Milan a couple of years ago. We know that uh, using uh, thermoablation, we've just presented our 11.1 year results over in the American Venus Forum, and using transmural death and making sure we're always getting thermoablation at least 95% through the uh, vein wall, we're getting uh, about a 97% destruction rate of the target vein at uh, over 10 years. The trouble is, as uh, Alan's already said about thermoablation, the trouble is you need to use tumescence because the, although some companies at the moment on the laser side and one or two on the radio frequency side are trying to convince us that we don't need tumescence if we use low powers, the reason of course they're doing that is they're doing it because they're not actually getting transmural death. They're going to leave the adventitia and most of the uh, external parts of the media alive, which means the chance of recanalization is going to be very high. The reason it doesn't hurt is it doesn't get out to the nerve and the, the pain fibers out in the adventitia, which means it's an incomplete treatment. So I think you've got to be very careful when you talk about thermoablation. If it doesn't hurt and you haven't got tumescence, you're probably doing an inadequate treatment. And I think you've got to be very careful. And the way I try to think of things is I try to think of things as science first and then interpret everything you're told by companies and everything after the science. So the most important thing is you need, if you're doing thermoablation, you do need tumescence. And if you don't need tumescence, you've got to answer what magic is it that stopped you getting destruction to the adventitia. I mean, you all know about thermoablation now and tumescence, so I'll sip over that one. I think the exciting thing, and I think this is why Claravain has been so exciting and uh, glue to an extent as well, is the fact that you've got tumescentless, the opportunity for tumescentless. And as Alan was saying before, of course, we already have one set of tumescentless uh, treatment, and that's foam sclerotherapy. But as Alan was also saying, we also know that it's not very good. Um, and with the greatest respect to all of our um, uh, the BTG, etc., who are making foam sclerotherapy, the results in the truncal veins uh, Unless you're doing specialist long line or, or the, the, these new tumescence procedures to try and actually stop the foam from migrating or being washed out, the results of just injecting foam as a true tumescenceless uh, way of doing it aren't very good at all. And even to get into anything that's uh, approaching uh, any of our new endovenous techniques, you have to do multiple reinterventions. So what we know about foam sclerotherapy is certainly in smaller veins, they do much better. And uh, where the cutoff is, is five millimeters, six millimeters, seven millimeters, it doesn't really matter. And as I presented in Milan, of course, that's only because we can measure it. It's uh, ridiculous to actually look at what the uh, depth of the wall is. Uh, sorry, what the um, uh, diameter of the vein is. I think that wine's having an effect on me as well. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not so much the diameter of the vein. We can measure that with ultrasound, so we do measure it. It's not what we want to know. What we want to know is we want to know what the depth of the wall is. We want to know how much destruction we're getting. So when we talk to people who are doing very thin-walled uh, venous abnormalities, of course they're getting fantastic results in 20-30 millimetre veins. And the reason is, is because they've got very, very few media cells to kill as part of the destruction. When we're looking at a great savenous vein, or a small savenous vein, of course, what we've got is a much thicker wall. And so therefore, when we look at the traditional studies, we suddenly find that diameter, because that's related in most patients to the wall thickness, that's why uh, the smaller veins, or in other words, thinner walls do better. That's also why when you then make uh, veins go smaller with cold, you still don't get the effects you'd expect from that size of vein. 
So when we look at the penetration, there's uh, some work, and I've just been hearing there's more work should be coming out of Charing Cross unit as well from Haley and Allen. But um, what's been published so far is that the STS does seem to have a greater penetration than polydocanol. And I know at the moment, of course, uh, Clarivane uses polydocanol in the US, but I believe it's also being used with STS now as a liquid form. And what, what I always am fascinated by, before I ever use any technique and before I start uh, ever putting it into a patient. I, I have to understand the mechanism. And I have to see proof in my own hands, in vivo or in vitro, that I can actually see what the mechanism is. So I don't believe it's an endothelial damage. I believe you, if you don't get damage into the medial wall and you don't get quite good fibrosis of the media, you are going to get reopenings and you're just going to end up with thrombosis. So a lot of the information that's about at the moment about Mocker and Clarivane is, of course, just clinical. I always like to know a bit deeper than the clinical, so we know that there's a claim of 97%, um, which I'm sure is right, but what we don't know is why are they getting that result, whereas if you're using foam, as polydocanol, as we just heard, you get nowhere near 97% closure. So there's got to be a good reason for that. Um, this is a patient who was referred to us who'd had uh, Clarivane two months previously and is widely patent. And I don't think the surgeon is bad at all. I think there must be some factor that means that for some reason the same equipment, the same dose, used some way would, is being done isn't closing the vein. So looking right down at the cellular level, because I think that's where we have to start, the cellular and the morphological level, what we know is we get destruction. And the very simple thing of that is you get tissue on the end of your wire. So when the clarivane comes out, you can see tissues there. So we know we're getting some sort of destruction. It's not just thrombus. Um, this paper actually just got published just after we started putting our study together, which we thought might have stolen our thunder, and in some ways it has. This was done in five patients in Germany. It's a very nice uh, study, and they took explanted GSV, and what they did was they put the clarivane technique in, and then they harvested one centimetre section of it and looked at it under the microscope. And um, what they actually saw, which was very interesting, was they saw quite a lot of damage to the endothelium in most areas, but virtually nothing on the mechanical side that was any deeper than that. And of course, there's lots of criticisms with this sort of uh, study. Um, one of the most uh, important ones is, of course, is um, we don't actually know if this was a successful or an unsuccessful treatment because it was done in ex vivo <laughs> a bit of vein. But what we do know about it is certainly from the way this was used in the study, it doesn't seem to go deeper than the endothelium. So this asks, really brings us lots and lots of questions. So the point is, do different pullback feeds respect the efficacy of the, um, of the treatment? Is it that what we're doing is by denuding endothelium, are we allowing the sclerosant into the media? And that's therefore what we're trying to do to get an improvement. Is the endothelium almost acting as a shield protecting the media from the sclerosant? And by, if we can scrape away the endothelium and get the, uh, sclerovain, uh, the sclerotherapy rather straight into the media, is that why it's so successful in the people who's working. And that would go along with Barry Price's uh, comment just then. I think if you get a fibrin uh, lining of the wall because you've got a delay, that would actually put very much towards that as a mechanism. Also, what happens with vein diameter and with the depth of penetration and uh, how deeply not only you're pe penetrating uh, the physical side, but how much you're penetrating with the chemical side. And this is, as I said then, do, is this all about denuding the endothelium first before you're doing sclerosis? So is that what we're actually doing with Clarivane to get the success we're getting in bigger veins, but in a, without uh, what we wouldn't expect with the foam sclerotherapy? So my simplistic way of looking at things is purely and simply a normal vein, intima media adventitia. What's the physical damage? So first of all, what our study is looking at is we're looking at the, the physical damage, and this can be done in a simple histology. We'll be looking at it. Are we actually looking at just an endothelial intimal damage, or are we looking at a phys deeper physical damage? And if we are just looking at a um, deeper damage, uh, is, that a way, is there a way we can get even deeper? Or if it's just superficial, do we have to just accept that? If we slow it down, does it mean it doesn't go any deeper? So that's one of the things we're looking at, is can we get the uh, destruction on the physical side deeper. Then, of course, what's the chemical damage? We already know about the destruction of endothelium. We've got some very good dose-related uh, studies looking at endothelial cells in mouse endothelial cells as to what concentration you need of the different sclerosants. And, in fact, it's minute amounts of uh, sclerosant compared to what we use clinically to actually kill endothelial cells, which is quite surprising. Um, and if you add those two together, 
are we therefore getting destruction of the uh, of the cells? And one of the things we're doing in this, rather than just a histological study, I'm very fortunate to be working at the University of Surrey, and we actually have some cell culture techniques. And what our aim is, is to try and take some of those cells from the media, and even if they look like they're living on histology, what we're trying to do is we're trying to see how we actually killed or damaged those cells. So on H&E histology, they look normal, but in fact what we know is they're dead cells or dying cells that will cause fibrosis. And that would explain why Clarivane, therefore, is so much better than just foam sclerotherapy, but in the, in the same size vein. So what we're doing is we're using ex vivo explanted vein at the moment. So we're looking for the histology for the uh, microscopic trauma, and then we're looking at cell cultures to try and find out what we're doing to the endothelium and the media. And then hopefully that when we get the answers to those two parts of the story, we can put them together, and we can actually then talk about the vein wall integrity in itself. And the aim of the study is purely and simply, once we've understood those factors, we should be then, rather than just saying we do X number of centimetres and X amount of stuff going in as a sort of cure-all, we should be able to say, for this vein, we are going to do this speed, because we know it's that depth, this amount of sclerosant at that, and we should be able to do it for a very scientific approach. And hopefully, we should be able to get excellent results from doing that. Thank you very much. There shouldn't be any questions after that. <laughs> no, thank you.